and welcome. Good afternoon to all. It's a pleasure to have you with us to one more webinar of ELTA Academy. Um, it's always uh, a pleasure to be uh, leading these uh, webinars because I can then talk with people that I admire, that, that I admire their work, and I can learn with them. So you see, for me, it's always a, a privilege. And after having the first webinars in a more technical uh, tone, um, I thought it was more than time to have another perspective and a very needed perspective. Um, so today we are here with a philosopher uh, and hopefully she will uh, provide us a roadmap um, to support this idea of what policy and regulation can also be in the challenge of this legal tech environment. Um, but better than myself, uh, to tell you who she is. Um, I want to introduce you to Federica Russo, our guest today. Um, and she can tell us a little bit about herself before we start a presentation that she uh, kindly uh, did to us. Um, but we want to know a little bit about you, Federica, um, and a little bit about what you do, uh, your relationship with technology and philosophy um and yeah tell us a little bit about you Felipe. thanks uh, so much marisa for the invitation and for uh, this uh, opportunity i'm a philosopher of science technology and uh, information i am based at the university of amsterdam where i teach and i carry out research on those uh, teams by training i am a philosopher of science really and I've been working a lot uh, on the uh, biomedical and social sciences, and then uh, slowly looking into uh, questions of uh, uh, technology, how much technology is uh, part of our uh, scientific enterprise, and how uh, understanding this uh, techno scientific. Uh, uh, component uh, should change the way we understand what science is and the number of uh, philosophical questions about science, for instance, uh, what is scientific uh, knowledge, what is scientific understanding, and how this has uh, consequences for, uh, let's say, the decision we make uh, based on uh, scientific knowledge. And then at the same time, I also got uh, interested uh, in um, how technology uh, is uh, uh, making profound uh, changes uh, at the level of uh, society at large, everyday life, and especially how digital technologies are uh, urging us uh, to uh, uh, ask the deep questions uh, uh, again and i and i found uh, uh, your uh, your call for this webinar very uh, intriguing because of course there is a lot uh, uh, to be discussed about uh, regulating technologies and then we are not probably asking the even the bigger question uh, uh, why do we want uh, technology uh, in the first place and so what I'm hoping to, to contribute today is my kind of my uh, two cents on uh, the relations between uh, technology and uh, us and uh, how rethinking um, the relations between technology and humans then can be the new basis for discussing uh, questions at the legal level, at the level of regulation. This is, this is perfect. And then also, of course, um, even if we're going to uh, try to learn as much as we can with you today, I challenge everybody that wants to interact with us to do so. You have the Q&A, you also have the chat, and I will do my best uh, to support this interaction. Um, I will take my own notes and my own questions. Um, because, of course, um, I, have, I have a confessed passion by philosophy. And as you say, Federica, I remember when I was still a law student, um, reading a little book of one of the best uh, professors uh, uh, in my country, and it was law today and what, what, what's the bigger purpose, right, even of the law. So that was a big question mark. And now the big question mark of technology itself, it's an added question mark and not an and or, right. So having the opportunity to start this spark, hopefully that will bring many more conversations to the table. 
um, that allow us to open our, our horizons and also to understand how can we regulate, what can we do, what are the policies, and understanding that we cannot have tech without the, the basic core of humanities itself, right? So, as I say, you are all invited to um, send us your questions, your comments, interact with us. And now, Federica, please, you can have your presentation and um, I will be here learning. Thank you very much. So allow me a second while I share my screen uh, properly, which always takes a few seconds. So no worries. Okay, can yes, you see now? Okay, so now it is in in the in the full screen mode. Let me just get rid of this bar over here. Okay, I should be all set now. Uh, as I said, very many thanks uh, to you, Marisa, for this opportunity. I'm really honored that I am asked to, uh, to give my two cents on these uh, big uh, issues uh, concerning technology and uh, regulation. And I really love uh, the, the broad vision that Marisa has about technology and, uh, and the legal uh, framework and the idea that we need uh, more humanities uh, into these uh, conversations. I'm not a legal scholar, as I said, uh, I am a scholar uh, uh, in philosophy, thinking a lot about the technology and digital technologies from a philosophical perspective, especially looking at techno-scientific context, but not uh, all, all, not only. And um, I am myself wondering what kind of a new or other vision of the human technology relations we need for uh, for the future. So. Today, I will try to, to give you uh, some introduction of uh, uh, philosophy and philosophical thinking around these, uh, uh, these topics. I will uh, start uh, with uh, uh, some uh, with, the, with the fact that uh, technology is pervasive in uh, techno in uh, in science and in everyday life, and this uh, in many ways uh, uh, leads to two widely accepted ideas. One is that uh, uh, technological development is a kind of necessity; we cannot stop it; it has to happen. And uh, the second idea stems from the first that we need. Uh, technolo technology regulation to kind of put some borders on this uh, development that we sometimes we don't know how to handle. And against these uh, widely accepted ideas, I will uh, instead try to say uh, something different. I will try to say that we need uh, to think more of the relations between technology and humans because technology needs us. Technology needs us more than it needs laws or even before it needs laws to put a kind of the, board, the, board, the borders. And so I will try to introduce a number of ideas and of authors from philosophy to explain this idea that technology needs us. And so how to make a first step in rethinking the human technology relation questions. Okay, so let me get uh, started. We know that technology is uh, uh, everywhere. It is uh, everywhere in our everyday life. Uh, we think that computers and smartphones are changing our lives. Technology is present in our day life and it has changed our lives even when you consider the very simplest form of technologies that have been invented and used from a skew driver to uh, uh, ashes or something like that. And likewise, in science, instruments are uh, pervasive. Now we believe that uh, uh, science cannot do without the big instruments uh, from the Large Hadron Collider to mass spectrometers or optical telescopes that are as large as a village. But we have to realize that technology has been there also in the old and remote uh, past and kind of being in this partnership with us in producing uh, knowledge. So, but sometimes because technology is so much everywhere, we tend to uh, develop or agree that uh, there are two consequences. One consequence is that uh, uh, technology develops, it has to develop, and we cannot stop this development. Or in other words, uh, 
technological development is a necessity. And this may sound good for those uh, uh, who think, who have kind of a, a faith that technology will solve all of our problems. For instance, our medical problems, health will change uh, dramatically thanks to uh, technology or also the other way around. But let's say that we cannot stop this process of technological development. And I will want to nuance this idea. And in fact, argue that technological development is not a necessity. It is instead a choice. And we have a role in this choice. The second idea that uh, has been largely accepted is that we have to regulate technology and we have to regulate technology precisely because uh, of technological development and because technology can easily go astray and also we have to put some boundaries to what technology can and cannot do. And here I will try to show that before we get to the question of regulation, we need to think deeply of what we want technology uh, for. And so against the tide of having these two ideas in the back of our mind, I will try to say that technology needs humans, it needs us more and before it needs uh, laws. So how can we think uh, differently about technology? First idea is that technology is not a necessity. We can get out of this trap of technological determinism, and this is a concept that I will introduce in a moment, and we do not need to fall into either utopian or dystopian views. These are opposite views that I will also explain. And so there is a way in which we can really develop a balanced view about uh, technology. Second, the idea is that technology needs us because we are the inventors. And to explain our role in inventing technology, I will introduce ideas from two thinkers. One thinker is Gilbert Simondon, and the other one is Norbert Wiener. And we we will be able to explore the role of the inventor, the designer in this uh, process. Technology also needs us because we use it. And so we are in this process, not just because we are the initiators, but also because we can make a difference in the way we use technology. And so we really need to analyze the role of humans in this techno-scientific process in the kind of all of our capacities, so to speak. And so this will lead me to conclude that technological development is really our choice. And so we really have an important role in deciding which processes we want to initiate and we do not want to initiate. And so for this reason, the question of regulation has to be asked the moment we can kind of have a clear idea of what we want to, to initiate. So let me start with the idea, with the concept of technological determinism. I will try to explain some of these concepts in the simplest uh, term, although philosophers are well known for making things very complicated. But let's try to put it this way. Um, you can have a broadly two views about uh, technology, a utopian view that says that technology will change or will lead to changes for the better and for sure. So it is a kind of a blind faith in the good things technology can do. Think of uh, Rifkin uh, talking about, um, these are, sorry, they are inversed in the, in the slide. Think about Negroponte being digital or dystopian views uh, that instead says that technology will lead to changes for the worse and for sure. And this has been kind of the, the critique in the end of work by Rifkin, for instance. Now, associated with the utopian and dystopian views, and so kind of a predetermined uh, um, output of the technology, there is also uh, an ethical question with it. But where does the moral question of technology uh, comes from? Why do we ask so many ethical questions about technology? And uh, here, very often, we uh, think that the ethical question in technology arises because technology is some kind of an application or it is an applied uh, science. And so normative questions about technology arise because uh, 
you apply something, not because you develop a theory. So the problem is not have nuclear physics talking about all the, the, the physics process happening at the, at the atomic level. The problem is using the atomic bomb, not understanding how it works. So if you really want to put it very roughly. But interestingly, this distinction between pure and applied science has been challenged. And here there is a very interesting work, for instance, of, uh, of Douglas that says that the very concept of pure and applied changed over time, and not just because of epistemological and methodological question, but also because of historical and sociopolitical context. So what counts as pure science and what counts as applied science can be uh, can be very different depending on this historical period and on the context. So we shouldn't take this as the very basis for the question of uh, morality in, uh, in science. And so just as there is no pure scientific or a kind of applied science, we should more thinking in terms of technological and techno-scientific practice and techno-scientific objects. And this is an idea that I have recently developed in my uh, monograph. So here we are in a moment where we are confronted to technology with two opposing views, the utopian and the dystopian, and asking, but why is technology posing so many moral questions? possibly because it is applied, not so much. So how can we get out of this deterministic trap? One uh, way to get out of this trap is to problematize what technologies are. And some authors uh, tried to argue that technology technologies are not neutral instruments. There is a very classic argument in the literature uh, proposed by Wiener in uh, Do Artifacts Have Politics, in which he says that things are not politically neutral, neutral because they can foster or hinder social communication and relations, trade, etc. In other words, things are not just things but are also part of an environment and just for this reason they have a political character and this argument has been echoed by another philosopher uh, Hans Rader who um, many years ago and also recently has been trying to explain the sense in which technologies are inherently normative because they act in an environment and they are kind of part of our agency. So because they operate in an environment and they have a materiality that we interact with, uh, this makes them um, subject to an ethical assessment, but even before that, they, it makes them uh, inherently normative instruments. Or in other words, again, it is not because there is this pure and applied thing that is at work, but because we do things with technologies. And it is for this reason that they are not neutral. There are some other ideas that you may want to introduce to understand what technologies are and can do. One is that technologies are really possibilities. And this idea has been introduced by Wiener, who was uh, the pioneer of cybernetics. And back in the 1940s, he tried to um, to show that cybernetics offer possibilities that we can decide to develop or not. You see, so here the idea is that we don't have just to subscribe to the blind faith that because we can operationalize everything, automatize everything, this will be for the best or for the worse, but we really have to make choices about what we want uh, to develop. And from the possibilities, there is another idea that will help us a lot. And this is the idea of an affordance. We usually ask, what can, what can technologies do? But I would like to reverse the question on its head and ask instead, what do technologies allow us to do? And this idea of an affordance 
comes uh, from the work of Gibson in psychology. And you can see how technologies are something that allows us to do some things or other things, just as a different shape of a handle will allow us to open a door in different circumstances under different ways and in different, um, and in, in different modes. So we really have to start reversing the question of what we want to do with technology and what a technology will would allow us uh, to do instead that just what technology can do as if it can act on its uh, own. Now, the thing is, um, things got much more complicated with the advent of digital technologies. With digital technologies, we had to develop new meta narrative. Now, the word of meta narrative may sound very intimidating to you, but actually, a meta narrative uh, you can understand it very simply as the ability of synthesizing complex philosophic, philosophical political ideas into a single theoretical framework. For instance, the Enlightenment had this idea of the encyclopedia and of the possibility of universal knowledge. And then there are moments in history where these meta narratives break down because we are entering in a new phase. And this is exactly what happened with digital technology. Digital technologies have produced a break and possibly a form of control in the regulation of the market, but they also bear opportunities, for instance, in facilitating the collective discussions of norms. This is an idea that French philosopher Lyotard has been proposing in the postmodern um, condition. And likewise, the digital revolution calls for a different way of understanding reality, knowledge, and ethics. And we need to develop new conceptual tools for this, this new way of being. This is something that philosopher of information, Luciano Floridi, has tried to explain in his book uh, titled The Fourth Revolution. So it is true that we entered a new phase with digital technologies, but instead of being led by either blind faith or um, blind despair, which really understand what has changed with digital technologies and with technologies more generally. And from this basis, to ask again questions about uh, regulation. Okay, so with this now, I would like to try and rethink the relations between technology and us, or what can we constructively uh, say about us and technology in a way that will help us think of better regulation for the future. I, I would like here to use again some, some work from the philosophy of information and especially by Luciano Floridi, who has coined some neologism to explain the new environment in which we are in. So he calls the infosphere the informational environment, which is the whole space of possible information that includes nature. And then he uses the term inforg, that stands for informational organism. Informational organisms are us, intelligent humans, but also intelligent engineered artifacts. This is a way to say that we shouldn't pretend that we have a special place in the infosphere. That is not the case anymore. We can process information just as a digital computer can do that. But there are also important differences between engineered artifacts that, hang, that process information and us. And we have to understand the similarities and differences. And on this basis, then to rethink the relations between us and technology. So there has been a deep change in the interactions with the external world and with ourselves um, with the advent of digital technologies. One big change is that, as I was trying to anticipate, is that 
there are no sharp boundaries between humans and technologies. Some people will try and resist this idea and will even be annoyed by the fact that there are no sharp boundaries or, or that you cannot really draw a, a very thick line between the, the human, the artificial and the hybrid agent. But hey, this is an idea that uh, is not new actually. This has also been developed in science studies and in feminist epistemology. What comes to mind here is, for instance, the cyborg manifesto of Haraway, in which she was trying to explain that no holistic or essentialistic, essentialist approach will succeed in answering the question of what human beings are. So the cyborg manifesto rejects the technological, the very idea of technological determinism. It says that social relations have an impact on technology too. And so we have to understand how socio-technical system, socio-technical structures, sources of powers are intertwined. That is what is key, not to draw the boundaries, but to understand the interaction and the interrelations between these fears. And so a feminist critique to essentialist approaches of what is uh, being human help us uh, not just a uh, blur, but really break these boundaries. We should kind of give up on having these uh, sharp boundaries because they are not going to help us any further. Questioning the nature of human beings is really to focus instead of relations and not on essences. So this sounds very radical and it is in many ways. Um, how can we then rethink the relations between humans and technology? Here I want to introduce an idea that again comes from the philosophy of information. This is the concept of in-betweenness. Try to think, where is technology or where does technology stand? So think for instance of how we use technology to interpose something between us and nature. An axe to split the wood, saddles to ride, my spectacles to see better. These are very simple forms of interposing a technology between a human and nature. But something has happened with the Industrial Revolution because, for instance, you have a number of technologies that interact with other technologies, but humans are still in the loop. For instance, if I take my key and I put it in the keyhole, I am making, I am making two technologies interact, okay? So I am still there. But now with the advent of digital technologies and the internet of things, then we see that there are technologies that seemingly do not need us to interact. This is the technology, technology and technology type of interaction. Think of certain algorithms or think of how automatically Facebook may post pictures on, on your behalf but wait, this further type of in-between re relation is really tricky because the absence of humans in this chain is, in my view, only um, an illusion. We are there and we have to be there. And this is what I'm trying to explain next. Technology really uh, needs us, especially with the digital revolution, Technologies enjoy much greater autonomy with respect to humans, but this makes the question of relations between humans and technology only more pressing. And next, what I want to explore are a number of ideas to understand this autonomy and agency of technology and how, after all, we are and we should be still in the driver uh, seat. So. The first idea to, to explore is that technology or technical artifacts have an individuality. This idea comes from the philosopher Gilbert Simondon, who was a French philosopher of techniques and who tried to explain the sense in which technical objects undergo a process of 
concretization. So technical objects are designed and assembled, and then from that moment they undergo a process or a process of concretization. We have to step back a moment, see how the parts hang on together, how an object acquires its own form and shape, and how it starts functioning. From concretization, the, the technical objects also has a form of individuation. It has an individuality. It is pretty much like your computer. At some point, it is really your computer and not just uh, a random computer uh, out of, of the factory. So technical objects do develop. But uh, there are similarities and uh, differences um, with living beings. There are ways in which this process of concretization and individuation is very similar to the ways in which we living beings uh, go towards uh, being individuals, but there is a big difference. We are not invented, whereas technical objects are uh, invented. And this is where um, we really have to mark an important moment of uh, uh, our role with respect to technology. Technology needs us to be invented. And this is something that um, Simon Don has explained uh, as well, because he has been taught us to think of technical ob ob objects not just for their purpose of use, but also for uh, there being any some kind of individuals. But as I said, unlike living beings, technical objects are invented. And this means that we humans invent and design technical objects. We are initiators of this process. And so if we have control on this process, we should also have responsibility. This is where a key word comes in. We should not forget that we are initiators of this process. Now, if we are inventors, then we should take on board the full responsibility that comes with it. And this is where I want to reintroduce ideas from cybernetics and from Wiener especially, who said very long ago that technology is more than an object with a purpose, just as Simon Don said, but also that we set this purpose. And precisely because this we set the purpose, cybernetics said Wiener is a form of moral philosophy. It is not just mere technology, mere invention of things. It is really a way in which you can change the world around you. And so you can choose whether you invent these things to do good to humans or to harm them. There is an intention behind that that it is important to consider from the very beginning of the invention process and not just at the end where you think that finally you have to regulate the use of technology. But that's not all. Technology needs us humans to be used. A technology uh, is there to be used and we are the users. So besides, um, an ethical component, let's say, at the level of invention, there are also important ethical questions at the level of, of use. We use technical objects for very many things. We use to make stuff, we hammer or nail, uh, we need the DAO, we accelerate particles, we fix a broken bone with technology, we also use technology to study parts of the world in science. That's something we cannot avoid uh, anymore. And we hold the responsibility for the reasons we use uh, these objects and for the modes of uh, using them. And so we humans decide why and how to use a technology 
rather than another. So here again, uh, there is a question of choice that come in very importantly, because remember, we started from the idea of technological determinism as if there was no choice, but in fact, there is a lot of choice to be made also in the use of which technology you want to employ for a given purpose and why and how you want to use it. So this leads me to uh, try and spell out in more detail this idea that technological development is a human uh, choice. Remember the idea of technological determinism, the blind faith and the blind despair, these both options concentrate on the wrong question. Um, the, we need to change the question into where do we want to technology to go and what should what should it do for us okay so because we are designers we choose and as inventors and as designers we choose the technical specifications epistemic purposes conditions and constraints we choose ethical political values that we kind of plug in into the technical artifacts so we need to rethink the process of technological design as including both the technical and epistemic specifications, but also the intended use and the misuse to be avoided. Of course, we cannot anticipate everything, but we do have to make an effort in anticipated the uses that we do want and we do not want to be made with certain technologies. So, this is where I, I like uh, the idea of having epistemology and ethics really joining forces, because with epistemology, we can make the design process epistemically good, thinking solidly about questions of transparency, for instance, in AI. But with ethics, we make the design process ethically good. So why do we want certain things? And what kind of goal are we pursuing with plugging in some values rather than others in the technical artifacts? And we have to internalize um, these processes. So ethics should not be the post hoc evaluation exercise. It should not be a watchdog. We should really recover a unity of science, technology, philosophy, and ethics. And this is where we can rethink also the role of tech, um, technology in the sense of technological regulation and law that should cement rather than constrain this synergy between epistemology and ethics. Let me repeat, if we have solid epistemology and ethics, law and regulation should be able to cement this and not just act, act as another watchdog on top of an ethics uh, assessment. Okay, so I'm, I'm, close, I'm, I'm close to conclude. Why does all this uh, uh, matter that we, we have, uh, um, that we go so deep into these uh, philosophical ideas? I think it matters because this binary thinking of utopian and dystopian views is always around the corner. And so beyond this binary thinking, we have to put the relations at the core of the discussion. And this is not a new idea. There is a lot of thinking about relations coming from French epistemology, from post phenomenology, from the philosophy of information. These accounts focus on the relations or on how technology changes the environment. The environment changes in response to technology and also on how we have to set up new relations with technology and with the environment. And so we really have an important role in leading this change uh, towards a goal that we want. So who should care about this? Well, we should really care 
because as I said, the design of technology comes with responsibility and the responsibility is double. It is epistemic in terms of initiating and carry out the processes of technological design. It is moral because it's, set, it's setting the purposes and the boundaries of the process. And as designers and users of techno-scientific objects, we play a big, big role in shaping the future and for the reasons and for these reasons, we are ipso facto moral agents. So I would like to close uh, um, this presentation with two quotes um, from uh, the work of Luciano Floridi, that he's a philosopher that I admire a lot. And in my view, he really grasped two important ideas. One is that of the moral agent. I'm going to read loud how he defines it. The moral agent is an agent that looks after the infosphere and brings about positive improvements in it so as to leave the infosphere in a better state than it was before the intervention. In other words, we are moral agents every moment we intervene in the infosphere and the technology or technological development is a big part of the way in which we intervene. So what do we have to do if we are worried that technology goes astray? This is where Floridi has a second very interesting idea. He says, the best way to catch the technology train, it is not to chase it, but to be at the next station. In other words, we need to anticipate and steer the ethical development of technological innovation. So I would like to close with these uh, uh, words and uh, I thank you very much uh, for your attention. Um, we are the ones thanking you, uh, Federica, for uh, this uh, uh, synthesis of so much that is in stake, of course. And I do appreciate that you managed to to do so. We have, I don't know if you are able to see the chat, uh, but we have Laura um, uh, engaging with us um, and uh, with very interesting uh, questions um, that I can leave you um, directly uh, uh, to, to read, but uh, also for the ones who cannot maybe later on when this is uh, in our YouTube channel, I would say that Laura was saying to us in the beginning, um, this is a lot of people saying that technologies are tools that humans use just as they have been since times immemorial. And a tool is an extension of the person uh, welding it, right? And then uh, she continues on that note it is possible to create a hammer that can hammer nails, but can't kill a person. And even um, if it were possible, uh, is the responsible to expect that people should spend time developing non-lethal hammers instead of one developing other useful tools. And she gives a smile. I, I do like this uh, metaphor <laughs> that she used of the hammers um, but what what do you have to say to, to Laura, Federica? Yeah, of course, uh, this is uh, also a big, uh, a big debate uh, in uh, the philosophy and uh, ethics of technology. Of, of course, uh, we can use uh, um, technical objects, artifacts, or tools uh, such as a hammer in a way that is uh, totally different and antithetic to what uh, uh, was designed for. What I was trying to say is not that uh, being clear about the intentions of the use and misuse is a foolproof protection from the, the misuse. That is not the case, of course, uh, of course uh, uh, not. Um, but in many ways, the, the hammer is, uh, uh, is probably not uh, the, the most interesting technical object uh, to uh, uh, to discuss because clearly with the materiality of objects, uh, you can have a very minimal intention and multiple uses. This is why technology is so interesting because uh, you can invent something and then it is used for another 10 things that the designer never 
thought uh, uh, of. But uh, where I find the, the question of intention very, very tricky are really digital technologies, algorithm, artificial intelligence, where we cannot ignore the fact that uh, the way in which we design and build up an algorithm may have massive inference in what we infer uh, from uh, data. And so we cannot be just naive and says, just as we did with the hammer, oh, but the hammer was not invented to kill me, and yet I was killed with the hammer. So I think there the, the, the discourse has to be really more and more uh, subtle. And it is very possible that we need to train engineers um, and designers in a way that we are they are even more aware than they are now that they have uh, um, an important responsibility in what follows up once the product is out uh, in the market and and that uh, takes me to uh, um, uh, also one of the reasons why i wanted to bring this topic to the table is that we see many good intentions, as you say in the, the in the beginning of, and, and also a little bit almost like this uh, uh, feeling that uh, technology is a new kind of god, or as you even use the word in the beginning, faith that it will solve it all. Uh, and sometimes it it doesn't. And for example, in a, in a world like the world of justice, right? Um, technology could even um, um, take part of the, the real um, reason of being of justice initially that was much more uh, or, or had such a, a, um, a human uh, element to it, right? There's, there's many uh, studies of, of what, what is really the intention of people, for example, when they go to court, what do they expect? Uh, and is it efficiency or is a humanization of their own uh, experience, right? What is this? What is the sense of justice that we have? Um, but this design or this idea of also the technology through efficiency will then be the, res the, the response of what we need can be a trap on itself, uh, uh, I, I would say. But do you agree with that, Federica? Do, do you think we can create this trap for ourselves? Yes, very much. I think uh, the, the the parallel that you are drawing with the, with the concepts of justice is uh, is really uh, spot on. You you can't uh, just uh, act uh, technically at the legal level without having without spelling out how, what you think justice is and in the same and in the same way i would like to say you can't just put on the market whatever we, you want without having an idea of what you would like uh, to achieve with such uh, artifacts i see that there is uh, an answer from uh, a reaction from uh, from laura and uh, yeah. um so she says, I was considering the quote uh, that I pointed at, I find, so to find yourself at the next station, considering humans and their use of tools in the past. So I am, Maybe maybe some maybe a clarification about the, the the hammer example that that Laura brought in because this is very interesting. Um, so. In part, what defines the good and the bad use is also a context. Okay, so if I go to the, to the supermarket and I go shopping with my car, I'm not expected to, to, to have a hammer with me, right? But if I am a carpenter, it is a very fine that I have a hammer and possibly many other tools in, uh, in, the, in the back of, uh, uh, in the truck of my car, right? So what I would like to say by this is not that these are justifications uh, in, in an absolute uh, sense, but also that we have to consider that there is never a technology in, in the absolute. There is always a technology with us in an environment, and we have to consider all of these uh, uh, relationships. Um, so th that's why I find the, the hammer example a bit uh, tricky also to be evaluated in abstraction of a concrete situation where we say, oh, but 
was this a use or a misuse of, of the hammer? So again, let's try to contextualize. Algorithms are not evil or good in the absolute, but we do know that certain way of designing algorithms can be harmful and not only for the design, but also for the use of the output of these algorithms, okay? So every one of us has a, a bit of responsibility in uh, how we relate with this technology at the various moments of the process, right? So it is not just to blame the designers or to blame the users. It is really to understand that it is a collective responsibility that we hold. And regulation should be there to help us to cement what we think the good interactions between us and technology uh, should be, if you see what I mean. Yeah, I do. And also a little bit in this interaction also, when we were talking about in the beginning in your slide, um, about the first slides that you introduced us about the utopian and dystopian image. Uh, I create my own uh, little um, draw of in this between utopian and dystopian, there's this commercial and academic world that have different rules, right? Because uh, uh, one thing that is very also complex is um, uh, the approach of technology when it's developed, for example, by research. And we would say with a tendency to seek good, right? Um, and another um, perspective that we all want to uh, think that corporates also want, even startups, right? That has such a nicer name that they are seeking for solving something but most of the time in the business sense they are not yeah. right and and some um how to uh, um align all, all these different worlds uh it's it's a huge challenge because we would think academics would then be uh, seeking uh, the good in yeah. the, their 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 uh, quest but then how corporate will interact in a sense when the business and the profits is their yeah. goal, yeah. right? Yeah. I think uh, you, 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 you ask uh, a critical question, I think, uh, uh, Marisa, and uh, uh, without uh, sounding too uh, idealistic uh, and having like a visionary uh, and uh, um, the, the, the idea that this can never be done, but I really wonder whether we should rethink uh, deeply what are the values and goals of all of this uh, uh, enterprise. Because um, of course, uh, if uh, we put uh, at the top of our priorities, uh, uh, making money uh, out of uh, the patenting of new technologies, Clearly, um, we need to allow as much competition as possible among the private sector and uh, put uh, all of the academic brains at the service of it, etc. But what if uh, we were to, uh, to give uh, more reward, not for how many patents are out there, but uh, which ones are the really useful ones? Okay, so maybe we will concentrate on less product thinking more and more ahead about what these products should be. I mean, it is not because we can technically develop something that we should develop something. That is an idea that I know that uh, scientists and uh, engineers don't like a lot. And I had uh, conversations in uh, some uh, AI forums in my university try to say this. And then they objected back to me, say, but you will slow down the development. I say, well, maybe we need to slow down. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe we really need to. to and wh that. where are you running to, right? Exactly. I always feel like there's an end line that everybody's in a spring to arrive where, yes. right? Precisely. I think that's another key question, Marisa. Thanks for asking it. So it has to go fast, but why does it have to go so fast and to reach what exactly? You know, because then you can say, oh, but wait, because we have uh, uh, to save lives. Yes, maybe uh, developments in medical technologies 
will save uh, lives. And then uh, you ask yourself about the ethical boundaries of this and the legal regulation of this as well. So it is as if we are trying to, to, to reach some goal we, and we do not think that the ethical and the legal should really what underpins them rather than kind of constrain from 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 uh, uh, from the from above, right? One could say it should be legal by design and not by default, right? In a sense that you would uh, adjust also and understand that I because you hear, of course, as I do, that a law or legal system is such a heavy and slow. A kind of a, a, a system, but um, maybe there's a reason why also systems are slow and they need to be slow. Yes. Uh, and and we, what I feel is that there's a shock now between what everybody wants to talk about this uh, wonder of progress, as as you say, like like children uh, completely um, um, in a playground, right? Uh, oblivious of anything else and having fun and these people that come and sound like the <laughs> the negatives in the room saying uh, do we really like you say want yeah. to run that uh, do we really want to build that why are we building and in the justice system and in all these technologies uh, um, sometimes I wonder um, if there's a really deep thought uh, also from the societal point of view because even if you are in a startup you are also a citizen so developing something that can affect the system that you are uh, living in is also a matter of uh, responsibility as you were saying right yeah. so are we uh, uh, what, what what scared you more uh, federica uh, uh, from the point of if you would think about the legal system but from the point of view of being part potentially part of the system, what scares you more in what we potentially can create in an exercise of creativity uh, loose? I, I guess I'm scared by the fact that uh, we miss uh, opportunities to, to, to create and develop uh, uh, really the, the technologies for good. And uh, because as you said, we run and we run and we run and we don't really know where we run. That's why we create the technologies that are uh, dangerous and uh, potentially uh, evil, no? And, yeah. and so it is really left to the user to make a good use of it, right? So um, because I study these things, I think I make, I think I make a sensible use of social media without uh, harming others and without, uh, I don't know, putting uh, my uh, relatives uh, in uh, awkward situations, uh, uh, breaking privacy or something like that, I think. But it is really on me. There is uh, very little by design that these things are really um, collegial tools for something for the good of everyone. Uh, yeah. This is, I guess, what what scares me that we are really uh, kind of left uh, uh, to our own uh, initiative as individual users uh, to uh, to understand what to do, especially with digital technologies. That 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 is a a concern that I share with you for sure, uh, and also as I being uh, just as such a, a important uh, pillar of society as we know it is uh, we want to uh, think about what is a free society justice is always a big part of it right yeah. um testing and experimenting uh, only with technology um feels um a sh shortcome of thought uh, where we could also take uh, the thought process to maybe create different procedures yeah. that would uh, make justice more um, efficient even with no, no technology whatsoever, right? Yeah, true, true, so, exactly, yeah. yeah. I see there is another question. Do we have time, Marisa? We have, we have. We will there not conclude, minutes. we will not yeah. conclude without this. Or, yeah. uh, uh, in a way, Laura was actually concluding her questions. So I would say that we would be able to, uh, 
finalize a little bit with this uh, reply into power. So. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm trying to to guess what is really behind the this latest question of Laura about the analogy with dynamite or nuclear technology. Uh, I guess what she's uh, or he's hinting at is uh, the, um, the the problem of a kind of uh, stopping uh, having new scientific uh, knowledge and how then it is applied. I will. La Laura to... did. Laura did a second question. She said, "What uh, would would then be the responsibility of legal experts?" Well, I guess uh, this is another area where we need uh, more interactions and synergies because it is not for nothing that we have uh, so much uh, ethical uh, screening and double checks uh, uh, in uh, all sorts of research projects, whether they comply with standards, etc. Of course, you can ask the question whether these uh, ethic screening forms are really effective or they are just window dressing. And that is, I think, uh, an important question, but is orthogonal to the one we are addressing. Uh, here, I think un until the moment we really put, um, um, until we really put uh, the um, the fact that we have to think ahead why we want something, then the rest is really kind of uh, of secondary importance. Um, so the role of legal experts should be really to to help the system to be what the system wants to be. And that wow. goes back to your question. And that, and that goes exactly <laughs> what is the system wants to be? What is this, the justice system that we want yes. to create? Do we want more efficiency or we want more humanity itself? Yes. And I think only when you are in the system, because a lot of people talk about the system without ever experimenting it. Yeah. And you should experiment also in different roles by using the system. Uh, it's like a, a, a doctor when he's sick and he goes to a hospital, right? Yes. How does he feel? I think that we should think about the system uh, by uh, trying to really walk on the system shoes and understand do we really want what we are creating or not. Yes. And that leaves me in a good note. Um, leaves me in the, in, in the invitation that all the ELTA members and all the professionals that uh, we'll have the opportunity to see this video on, on our YouTube uh, channel, because it will be there, um, to reach us, because I hope that this is just the beginning also of a branch, I will call it a branch, of thought in this legal tech um, association and community. I, yes, we are all enthusiastic of technology, as you, Federica, for sure. It, you, you must have the same relationship I have that is a love, fear, but a fear in a sense of reverence. Like we should really be mindful of what we are creating and, and decide it if we want to create it, right? So I will leave the invitation for all that want to reach us later on to reach Federica in, in LinkedIn to reach us, Elta, um, but understanding that it's part of our own role to work together and build a system that is not an accident, but it's also a, a choice. Uh, and we are building good businesses that support the system and not implode the system or the people that work on the system, right? Exactly. So, uh, meaning Federica, for sure, we will see you again. Who knows if we can have you um, one of these days in, in person, um, somewhere in Brussels or the Netherlands or in one of the places that also Elta is. Um, and for the ones who were with us today, thank you so much for your time. Laura, it was a pleasure to have you uh, engaging with us um, and, and all the others that were not, they were uh, just to, to listen to, to us today. But yeah, it was a pleasure, Federica. I really hope that we can see you many more times and that you can help us also with fresh eyes and non-bias uh, to help us think the, the map and the road to move forward. My pleasure, Marisa. Thank you so much and to everyone for listening. Thank you.